So they're pretty, um, pretty widespread and extremely cute. They are just the most charismatic little animals. Uh, and if you haven't seen one, we do have one. Her name is uh, Squishy Marbles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't choose the name. Uh, it was voted on by you here at the Nature Center, and that was the when it was Squishy Marbles. But uh, Squishy Marbles came to us in a very interesting way. Um, she came to us a couple of months ago. Someone brought her in and said, I, I had this salamander in my house. Um, has anyone heard of that before? Or any ideas on how it might get into someone's basement in the middle of winter? Well, they're fossorial, so they're underground in these mole tunnels. And if anyone has a really old house um, with kind of a, a stone basement, um, one of those mole tunnels might lead right into that basement. And the salamander's just following it and pops out and finds themselves trapped in someone's basement. And so this person, it's a, actually a fairly common occurrence. And unfortunately, the basement is probably not as well insulated as it is underground. Um, so luckily for this salamander, uh, the person brought it here, and, and now the salamander has a lovely home with us at uh, North Branch. Uh, so if you haven't seen one before, you might uh, take squishy marbles out so you folks can see her later today. We do know it's a female um, because uh, we'll talk a little bit about this. But um, the vent, is this a, oh yeah, the vent kind of the backside that behind the hind legs of the spotted salamander actually swells up during the breeding season in the males. Um, and she doesn't have a swollen vent and it's now coming into the breeding season. So we're pretty sure she's uh, female. Our next character is the wood frog. Uh, who's seen a wood frog before? This, as you can see, another super common frog in Vermont in pretty much every town. Um, in the state, uh, they have this beautiful kind of light brown color with this darker mask, uh, and these two lines that run along the sides of their back called dorsal lateral ridges, and they quack like a duck, which we'll hear in just a second. Uh, and uh, they're living in, in the woods. Anywhere we have woods in Vermont, you can find a wood frog. Um, just like the spotted salamander, they're eating any small invertebrate that, that will fit in their mouth. And they're very, very cute as well. Um, and you can see their <coughs> range is throughout the Northeast, but even up into Alaska and uh, against the Arctic Ocean, which is a pretty amazing thing. They're one of the northernmost uh, amphibian species in the world. And we wonder how um, an amphibian uh, would survive that, um, that kind of extreme uh, climate. And we'll talk about that in a minute. There's the how do I get this volume? Um, Sean's going to work on the volume because this is a really phenomenal. Yeah, it's a really phenomenal duck that sound. And hopefully we'll be hearing this in just a few weeks. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <coughs> And our third, our last character is the four-toed salamander. Now, who has seen this salamander in the lunch? Or anywhere? Okay, a lot fewer people. And that matches up nicely with our map. And you can see there are only a handful of places in Vermont where this salamander is found. Unlike the spotted salamander that can make its home underground in pretty much any field or forest in the state, these uh, four-toed salamanders require a really specific habitat. They like a certain type of wetland with a certain level of elevation gradient. And there are only a handful of places along the Connecticut River Valley and in the Champlain Valley where they've been found. They've never been found in, the, in central Vermont. So if you are surveying sites around here, you're probably not going to see them. Um, they, this is a really beautiful salamander with colors ranging from a slate gray to a kind of rusty red. Um, and then the real surprise is when you flip them over and their bellies are a pure white with these black specks on them. And it's a really beautiful little salamander. And they are small, they're about the size of a little, little Smarties package. Uh, and they're eating small invertebrates as well. This is a species of greatest conservation need in Vermont, unlike the wood frog and the spotted salamander that are pretty much everywhere. Because this salamander requires a really specific type of habitat, their, their, their numbers are pretty low, and uh, it doesn't take a lot to really impact their population, which we'll talk about more of 
Uh, and they're adorable. They're just really, really beautiful. So these animals are living mostly on or underneath the ground. The spotted salamander is in those road tunnels uh, underneath logs. They really um, need to stay moist. They're, they absorb moisture through their skin. So if they get dried out, it not, does not end well for them. So they're looking for wet places. And for an animal that's black with yellow spots, they can blend in amazingly well. It surprises me how well they can blend in um, with their color, but they do. Wood frogs, another one that's just everywhere in Vermont, and if you can kind of look at its color, it really looks like a leaf. Uh, and if you are walking through the leaf litter in Vermont, it's going to be hard to pick one of these out unless it moves. And then when it stops moving, it's going to be really hard to find. Just blend in so well. And this one, this um, four-toed salamander, as I said, they, they really like those lowland, um, those wet areas with really specific types of forests and really specific elevation gradients. Um, one of the amazing adaptations of this salamander is it has a little constriction at the base of its tail. And it, uh, if a predator grabs its tail, or even if it's stressed by a predator, its tail will fall off. Um, and its tail can actually wriggle on its own. So its tail will jump around and look just like a worm. And so the predator will say, ooh, that's a nice easy worm, grab that, and the salamander can scurry off. Now the salamander can survive, but it has to regrow its tail, which takes a lot of energy for a little salamander. Imagine trying to regrow your leg. Um, you know, you you know the salamander can do it, but it takes a lot. How of How long does it take? Like months or? Months? Yeah, months or even years. Ooh, yeah, wow. I've seen some salamanders that have little tail buds where they've lost their tail. Um, you see this in like redback salamanders; they lose their tail, and you can see it's healed over and starting to grow back. But it takes a long time. Um, yeah, these are beautiful, nice, damp places, um, forested wetlands for these four-toed salamanders to live. And it's not always easy to be an amphibian. Um, you're kind of on the bottom rung in the forest. Lots of things like to eat you. Uh, snakes, certainly. Uh, raccoons, possums. I often see possums at crossing sites. That, you know, it's a perfect little snack that's easy to catch. Uh, all sorts of small mammals. Uh, owls love uh, to eat um, amphibians as well. And uh, an interesting thing, have you ever heard of uh, wood frog eggs uh, on branches of trees? You heard of this? How do you think a wood frog egg mass that usually is in a vernal pool or a, a swamp would end up on the branch of a tree? From the owl. From the owl, exactly yeah. right. The uh, owls, greenhorn owls and barred owls will go to these vernal pools where the frogs and salamanders are breeding, and it is just the, the perfect uh, buffet for them. And they can grab that wood frog and they take it up to a tree to eat it. And the, um, the wood frog, in its last moments, uh, has the, you know, it, it wants to lay its eggs, and so it, it lays a little cluster of eggs that comes out about the size of a quarter. And then when it rains, that um, it absorbs water and kind of swells up to be this kind of almost softball size egg mass mm. on the limb of the tree. So sometimes near vernal pools you, you might see that and uh, it's uh, a sign that a wood frog probably was eaten by an owl. Yeah. Yes. It will it will probably dry out. Yeah, those those um, egg masses will will show you pictures of them. They take a, a while to develop. And if they dry out, they're not going to survive. And then how they survive the winter? Well, the spotted salamanders, uh, like we talked about, they're living underground. So it's actually pretty warm, and they can get by uh, fairly well. Uh, the four-toed salamander, similarly, is going down underground, is finding places between like rocky ledges underground where they can uh, spend the winter. But the wood frog is pretty um, phenomenal. The wood frog turns into a frog popsicle. And um, in, the, in the winter time, they have uh, special sugars and special proteins in their body. And the uh, proteins cause um, ice to form in a 
perfect alignment so that it doesn't break their cells. And the sugars uh, make, make it so that um, some of the ice doesn't form or that it forms at a much lower temperature. So they can survive. That's how they survive the winter in the Arctic. And they are totally frozen. Their, their heart stops beating. They're not breathing. There's no metabolism at all. They don't eat anything. If you were to find one, um, it's as hard as a rock. And then when it gets warm, about you know days like this where it's kind of sunny and in the 50s and 60s, um, they get they kind of warm up and they they thaw out from the inside out, which is pretty phenomenal. Their heart will start and then they'll start beating and then little by little they'll kind of thaw outward. Um, pretty remarkable. They sort of buried, like in yeah. The so they're right. They're actually right under the leaf litter. So probably walking through the woods in the middle of winter, you know more than a you know a couple feet or maybe even a few inches um, from a wood frog. Yeah, they just kind of tuck themselves down in the leaf litter and, and the snowpack really helps insulate them, um, which is one of the things that um, I'm curious to see with climate change is there's less and less insulation. Um, they can um, thaw and refreeze, um, but when we're talking about big swings in temperature with none of that snow to insulate it, I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with these um, wood frogs. Um, and really, this time of year, they're getting a, a few different cues to, to figure out that it's time to make a move. Uh, the soil is getting warmer. The ambient air temperature is getting a little bit warmer. The snowpack is melting. And then the big cue for them to migrate is the first spring rains. So we haven't had much for those here yet. But in the coming weeks, I'm hoping we'll get some of those first spring rains and see some amphibians moving. Uh, I was gave a talk last week down in Cornwall, just south of Middlebury, um, and they don't have, well, they didn't until this last storm, had any snow there. And so all these amphibians have kind of gone through the process of waking up and, and prepping themselves. And I visited a crossing site on a night where it was just sprinkling a little bit. And we had about a dozen blue-spotted salamanders crossing the road. So already down in Cornwall, um, there have been movements. So we're still a few weeks out here when we have, you know, in some places, two feet of snow. And it's pretty remarkable, um, the, the movements these salamanders can make. Spotted salamanders are traveling a quarter of a mile sometimes to get their vernal pool, which doesn't sound a lot to us, but for a creature that's like six to eight inches long, it's a big feat to move a quarter mile. And they're crossing woods and fields and, and making their way through wetlands and oftentimes crossing roads to get there. And they found that uh, this great study looked at how, how concentrated this migration is. And they looked at a few different vernal pools um, where the salamanders were migrating back. And they found that 90% of the salamanders that came back to this vernal pool arrived there in a span of five days. So this is taking place in a really short period of time. Now it varies based on local conditions, you know, like snowpack and weather. Um, but for a, a specific location, all of them may migrate in just a few days. And this is what it looks like um, in some places where we have a big, beautiful wetland here, and woods, and a road, a busy road, right in between. Uh, so this is uh, going to be a really hard place to be an amphibian, uh, to have to make it across this busy road every spring. And this is where they're, you know, this is, would be ideal for a, an amphibian. A beautiful, you know, small body of water, free of fish, and we'll talk a little bit more about why it needs to be free of fish. Um, but in an upland here, so they're, this is where they're spending their winter, is up in the um, forested areas, and then they're migrating downhill to these wetlands. So that, that would be a pretty nice place to be in the um, And unfortunately, this is what's happening. They're trying to cross the road, um, and they're getting squished. And um, you know, 10% a year over time can lead to the loss of an entire population. And in some sites, we're seeing as high as you know, a 25% or a 30% mortality rate. Um, and that's just not sustainable. They're, they're, they're going to be gone um, pretty soon. 
And so where they're breeding, they're definitely breeding in wetlands um, that are fish free, but the best place are these vernal pools. These are small depressions in the woods where snow melts and collects in the spring and stays there long enough through the summer for them to complete their breeding cycle. So that's laying their eggs, for their eggs to, to grow and hatch, and then those larvae to become either adult salamanders or wood frogs. Uh, so it's taking, um, it's taking months for that whole process to go through. So these vernal pools are really kind of special places in the woods um, that you know, need our protection. The Vermont Center for Eco Studies did this project where they look at um, satellite imagery uh, to find potential vernal pools and then went out and actually confirmed whether or not they were vernal pools. Some of them they found were, you know, like old agricultural implements that gave a certain signature that looked like a pond. Um, so they had to go out and field verify these. Um, but there are quite a few in the central Vermont area. And a lot of those we found were right next to roads um, where animals were having to cross from their uplands down uh, to the vernal pool. Um, these vernal pools uh, can't have fish uh, because the fish will eat the eggs and the, the larva of the developing amphibians. Uh, and these are really amazing uh, little ecosystems contained in themselves. They have um, all sorts of small invertebrates. They have uh, there are freshwater snails. There are uh, all sorts of uh, things living in these vernal pools that, are, that support the growing amphibians. And this is kind of the process of a vernal pool. It may not look like much uh, in the winter or in the early spring, but as the snow starts to melt, you, melt, you get the sense of a small pond um, within the forest. And as the summer progresses, it gets drier and drier until the end of the summer or maybe early fall, it's dried out completely. Some of them don't dry out completely every year, but a really important trait is that they dry out regularly enough that fish can't survive in it. And how they're breeding. Uh, these spotted salamanders are really amazing. Uh, and they're, they have an elaborate courtship where they're nudging each other and the males are really competing for the females. The males actually lay a packet of sperm. So uh, if you visit a vernal pool, you might see these little white sperm packets on the bottom of the vernal pool. And then the males kind of escort the females towards it. And the females are, you know, are choosing which packet looks the best. Uh, and the females are laying about 100 eggs, um, and sometimes multiple clusters of 100 eggs that are kind of all held together by this jelly-like substance. Uh, and this is kind of what it looks like. You can see this from Adiforce, there are those little white sperm packets. Uh, and you know, there are males laying the sperm packets, and then there are males also nudging females, you know, kind of come over here, check this out. Is that on your, that's underwater, right? This is, yeah, this is underwater. Uh, and it's actually a fairly deep pool. You can see some invertebrates swimming by. Um, that's why you see the salamanders swimming kind of towards you, because there's some depth to this pool. Um, but you get these really amazing collections of salamanders all together um, in a small area. Uh, so if you have a vernal pool near you that you can access, it's definitely worth checking out in the spring and watching this happen at night. It's pretty amazing. You can go to a vernal pool during the day, um, and you won't see a single salamander. During the day, they're all hiding under the leaves, and they're really hard to find. Um, but at night, is, that's when all the action happens. Uh, the wood frog, one of our earliest frogs to call, um, and uh, you hear that kind of chorus of those duck-like sounds. They are explosive breeders, um, which is, a, is a, not a nice sounding term, but what it means is that they breed really quickly and a lot. Um, they will lay um, egg masses of more than 700 eggs. They lay their egg masses all together, kind of in a big um, raft of eggs. And I've been to some ponds where, you know, there were some vernal pools where you look out on top of the vernal pool and it's just one giant mat of wood frog eggs. It's, it's pretty astounding. Um, and they breed doing this thing called amplexus, 
where the males are actually grabbing on to the larger females and, and they hold right on. And you will actually see the females hopping across the road with males already like getting a free ride and they don't let go. Um, <clears throat> and then the four-toed salamander is a little bit um, more unique than the spotted salamander and the wood frog. It, it needs really specific um, wetlands with sphagnum moss and they're not laying their eggs in the water like the wood frogs and the spotted salamanders. They're laying their eggs underneath this layer of moss right next to or even over top of the water. And then when the eggs hatch, they fall into the water. Um, so the eggs are in the water, but the larvae fall into the water. Um, and they really don't like it very high up, less than a thousand feet in elevation, which is also why they're restricted to the lower areas of Vermont. <laughs> Uh, so another project you can look into that kind of uh, works side by side with our project is the Vermont, uh, the Vernal Pool Monitoring Project. So a lot of the amphibians that we're uh, surveying are crossing to get to Vernal Pools. So we're really focused on helping them get there. This project looks at what happens when they get to that Vernal Pool. So they use citizen science uh, to go out and, and survey these Vernal Pools there's uh, an, a really an amazing uh, amount of data that they collect. And it, and it tells us a lot about the health of these pools and if they are sustainable over time and, and what sort of conservation they need. Uh, but this is our project here at North Branch, the uh, Amphibian Road Crossing, or ARC program. Uh, and when we started this out, North Branch had been doing some amphibian work. Um, previously and, and we decided we wanted to kind of formalize the way we did it and we set these three goals for ourselves. The first, to get you really excited about amphibians. Is anyone excited about amphibians yet? Okay. Yes. We're working on it. We're working on it. By the end of the month, we'll be there. So get people really involved and engaged in, in helping uh, with amphibian conservation. And then the next thing is to literally get the salamanders and frogs across the road to keep them from getting hit when they're on the roadways. And then the third is to collect some data. And the data that we collect are going to uh, planners, uh, e either local community planners, uh, conservation commissions, who are going to be able to uh, go to their communities and make change to the, the actual transportation infrastructure. And we'll see some pictures um, right here about what, uh, what can be done at a local level to help salamanders. Uh, and in some places, they've actually closed roads on nights where they know that there's going to be salamander migration. And if we know that 90% of the salamanders in one area will cross in the span of five nights, um, it may not be that terrible of an inconvenience for people living on a rural road uh, to have a detour on a couple nights a year, but it may save hundreds or even thousands of amphibians. Uh, and then another opportunity we have is when we're rebuilding our roads, uh, is to look at places where there are already culverts near crossings and make the culverts bigger. Uh, once you've dug a big hole in the road, it doesn't really matter if you put in a culvert that's this big or this big, but it does make a big difference um, for these amphibians. They'll, they, they'll cross or maybe go through a culvert that's this big, but are not as likely to go through a culvert that's that big. And this is really the, the you know, the best example we have of changing our infrastructure in Vermont. This was a, a really busy crossing uh, in Moncton, and they had a really high mortality rate. And they noticed that it wasn't sustainable. The number of amphibians that were getting killed at crossing at this site, um, they were going to lose some of the population. And so they got some, they kind of rallied the community, raised some money, got some grants and built this salamander crossing. It's amazing, I, I recommend going to see it. Uh, they built essentially this tunnel underneath the road. It goes from this upland forest and to the left is a wetland. So they're crossing underneath this tunnel. The kind of barriers help guide the salamanders to the tunnel. And then at the end, they have a little piece that kind of curves them back around if they get going the wrong way, kind of redirects them back towards the crossing. Um, and this is what it looks like. So I'm going to play a video where it's um, a picture every minute for an hour. And you can see how well this is working to get um, salamanders and frogs in the room. What yes. is the bed on the floor of that? 
Uh, it's oh, stones? Leaves. It's what? It looks like a stone. It's white stone. It's leaf litter. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, it, it's, nice yeah, you kind of see some of the leaves here. Yeah, okay. it's leaf litter. Okay. Um, so here's, here's what it looks like in action. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. It's pretty amazing. So. And what, what species? These are these are a number of species at this site. They have spotted salamanders. There are um, probably eastern newts and redback salamanders that happen to cross through as well. But the big one here is the four-toed salamander. That's a species of greatest conservation need in Vermont. That was the one they were really concerned about losing from this site. Um, and so, in addition to the amphibians crossing during their migration, year-round there are animals using these crossing sites. Uh, a lot of small mammals are using these. Um, so they're, they're a pretty amazing uh, development. And this is what we can do if we have really good data and really in, and really engaged community. And you, you all are a big part of this. So it really depends on citizen science <laughs> volunteers to get out and do this work. Uh, and Finn uh, here is an amazing uh, citizen scientist. He's, I think he's eight. Um, and he is really passionate about helping amphibians. Uh, and uh, here is a picture of a four-toed salamander. You can see that beautiful white belly with those kind of black specks on it. So how it works. The first step is to adopt a site. So we have sites we kind of looked at places in Vermont where there are uh, a wet area across the road from a big house. Um, and those are areas where uh, amphibians are more likely to cross the road. And we ask people to adopt a site so that you can look on the map and see is there a site near you. And then step two is to actually go out and check these sites. So on rainy evenings uh, in April, sometimes as early as March, late March in some places in Vermont, but mostly the month of April and even into early June in our snowier places, uh, you go up to your site and you essentially walk the stretch of road. Uh, and while you walk, you're picking up amphibians, helping them to cross the road, and then tallying them down so we can have a record of what's actually there. Um, and then we ask people to uh, photograph some of the rarer ones uh, that we really want to you know, make sure we have good documentation on. And then uh, turn around and walk back and record another set of data uh, and do the same thing. And so you'll notice that you know, we have spotted salamander and wood frog uh, on here and four-toed salamander, but there are a lot of other characters we haven't talked about yet. So I want to briefly go through and share some of these other amphibians with you uh, so that you can learn more um, in case you see them. And it is also in our volunteer manual uh, that you can take home with you and study up a little bit more. Uh, the first one is this. Uh, Eastern redback salamander, it is perhaps the, the most abundant vertebrate in the, the forests of the Northeast. They are everywhere. They are one per square meter in some areas, which is astonishing. Uh, and they are living uh, kind of under the leaf litter in pretty much any forest in Vermont. Uh, and they are living kind of underneath fallen logs and things. And really, they're not migrating. These are, are um, fascinating in that they're a really terrestrial salamander. They don't need water to breed. Um, they, you know, they are finding enough moisture in rotting logs to lay their eggs. So they don't need a big pond or anything to breed. They're not really migrating. But just because there are so many of them throughout the state, occasionally they cross the road. And that's what we're seeing. So we're not really worried about them. Um, in terms of uh, a, a population level problem at a road crossing. But it's interesting to note when they do cross. And they have this kind of beautiful dark red back uh, and a kind of creamy yellow belly that you can't really see there. An interesting thing with this species, there are actually a few different color morphs. Uh, there's one that lacks some, some pigment, so it kind of has a yellowish back. And there's one that's kind of all lead, you know, kind of gray. Uh, and that one is more prevalent in the south because it can be active at higher temperatures, being all black. And so what's happening is as climate change is, is kind of moving, progressing, and it's warmer, 
they're seeing uh, higher levels of the lead uh, colored red back salamander compared to the red colored red back salamander. And so there's a really interesting program that's studying these salamanders all throughout the Northeast and watching fewer and fewer of these actual red back salamanders. And at some point, they may all be black or lead, and then we'll have to change the name. Um, <laughs> and then this is one that uh, we can see uh, here in central Vermont, the Jefferson salamander. This is another really big salamander, about the size of our spotted salamander. And it's this really kind of uh, more brown uh, than black or even gray. And it does have a little bit of blue. Sometimes you see them really with no, not much blue color at all, just mainly kind of this kind of brown, gray color. This is another species of, of concern in Vermont. They're a mole salamander. They're living most of their lives on the ground. They're one of our earliest migrants um, in Vermont. And uh, they also require a little bit more specific of a breeding habitat than the spotted salamanders uh, do. And they also uh, interbreed with our next species, the blue spotted salamander. This one's harder to find in central Vermont, mostly in the Champlain Valley, but there are a few populations in central Vermont. Um, the same shape as the Jefferson and the spotted salamander, but a bit smaller. And instead of kind of a gray-brown base color, they are really black. They're really a jet black salamander with these bright blue spots on them. They're really pretty. Uh, and they're doing the same thing. They're living underground and coming out uh, to breed in the spring. The tricky thing with the, these two salamanders is that they, they hybridize. And when they hybridize, most of them, actually like 99%, end up being female. So they have these populations where you can't really tell if it's a Jefferson or a blue spotted salamander. They're somewhere in between. And 99% of the population is female. So all it takes is one male from one species or the other to get in there um, for them to all breed. Uh, and this is one where we're asking people to submit photos if they do see it. That way we can help you figure out where it is on the spectrum of blue spotted to uh, Jefferson salamander. Anyone seen an Eastern Newt before? Mm -hmm. This is probably um, our most frequently reported, most commonly identified salamander uh, in Vermont. They're in pretty much every pond and swamp in the state. They're really widespread. They, um, they have a fascinating life cycle where they start out in a pond as a larva. They grow up to this juvenile. The juveniles leave their wetlands and roam for sometimes three to four years on land. Um, as this kind of orange salamander, this, what do we call this? The kind of reddish, yeah, red Fs. So they kind of are roaming land as these red Fs. And uh, after a few years, they find their way back to a uh, pond, and they turn into this olive green uh, color and spend the rest of their life in the water. So it's not like the other salamanders where they're making a huge migration in a really short time but they're kind of roaming all over the place, which is why sometimes we see them at road crossings. We're not really concerned about them um, from a mortality standpoint at a road crossing, but it's an interesting thing to note when they come through. I've actually seen them in a cluster of 20 and 30 at a time. Yeah, and it's probably areas where there are, you know, where they're just the right, you know, mix of woods and, and ponds nearby. They don't actually require fish-free ponds. They're really good swimmers. And so they can tolerate fish to some degree. Uh, here's one that we also see uh, a little bit later at our crossing sites, not so much early on in the spring. But our American toad, this you know, kind of chunky, warty uh, looking thing, uh, they're living a lot uh, on land, but do require water to breed. So they're, they're finding a pond. Uh, they don't have a huge migration. Uh, really concentrated like wood frogs or spotted salamanders. Uh, so we don't see them in huge numbers at crossing sites, but we do see them. Spring peepers we see a lot of at crossing sites. Just like the wood frogs, they're spending uh, the winter kind of right under the leaf litter and uh, are, are um, waking up and moving across the roads in big numbers. Uh, I think this, uh, there was a site in Stowe that uh, Stowe Land Trust adopted last year that happens to be right next to one of their properties. 
and they had 99 of these cross the road at their site in about an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really small, about the size of my thumb, which also makes them really hard to pick up um, at a crossing. They hop really well too. They have these little pads on their toes. Um, so just like tree frogs, they can kind of stick and cling. Um, someone at our last training showed me a picture of one that was stuck to her window in her house. Uh, she thought it was a tree frog. And um, the way to tell the difference, um, if you're kind of not sure what this little frog that's hopping around is, if you look at its back, it has the cross, this kind of X on its back, uh, where its Latin name Crucifer comes from, uh, is this, this cross is, or X on your back. So that's a, a surefire way to know you found a spring creeper. Why, why did they change the name, the specific name? Oh, the genus. Oh, the genus name? Pseudocris? No, oh, it used to be Hilo. It used to be Hilo, which is the um, tree frog genus, right? And they uh, changed it to the chorus frog genus. Um, all these frogs that make these little kind of peeping sounds. Uh, and the, that Pseudocris is a uh, false. Pseudo is cross. Chris is cricket. So these sound make these kind of really high-pitched uh, notes that sound almost like a cricket. So this is the, the false cricket frog with an X on its back. <laughs> what its not name is. And so you can kind of hear, I'm going to play the sound, you can hear that, um, that uh, false cricket sound. And this really for me is a sign of spring. I know spring has arrived, is here when I start hearing the spring peepers. They're pretty amazing when they get to their wetland. They, um, they want to find a perch where they can really project from. So they use those towpaths to climb up high on cattails and reeds. And they'll actually fight. The males will kind of push each other off and try and uh, get to the highest perch so that they can broadcast their voice. And they're really loud. Really loud. Um, so those are all the amphibians on our checklist that we're asking folks to really survey for. Um, when you get done walking your transect, um, I, I want to show you just kind of, we have these, uh, these checklists for you to go through these data sheets where you're asking folks to collect the number of amphibians, both alive and dead, what the weather conditions are, the road condition, and then counting passing cars. We printed them on right in the rain paper because these are kind of wet, rainy nights that we're doing it, and we did Field test it. Zach, what are the rain conditions right now? Wet. <laughs> How'd you describe that? Downpour. Okay, that sounds about right. <laughs> so they, they do they do work in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, once you've once you've collected your data, you've you've had a wonderful night helping amphibians cross the road. Uh, you can go home and put this data actually into our system. So it's got you know everything that your data sheet has. You can plug it into the computer or. If you want to just do it on your, you know, your phone or your tablet at the site, you can do that as well. And step four is congratulate yourself. You just help some amazing animals uh, get across the road uh, and collect some really important data. Uh, and so with that, um, I want to ask for a couple of volunteers. Yeah, nice <laughs> right there. You weren't taking that back. Yeah, okay. You can go back there with Sean. One more volunteer. Do you want just two? Yeah. Is two enough? Good. One more volunteer? Would you like to volunteer? What's your name? Sierra. What's it? Sierra. Sierra? Okay, hand on back to Sean. Yeah, that's yeah. perfect. Lucy. Lucy. Okay. Hi, Sierra. Hi, Sierra. So they're, they're going to go get ready. Uh, but I want to talk about how you make sure you're safe. We're asking you to go out on the side of the road on a rainy night and it's cold and uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not the best conditions to be standing next to the road. So a flashlight is really important. I bring a headlamp and a spotlight. The headlamp is more just so I can see where I'm going. The spotlight or a flashlight is really to find the amphibians. So one, you know, so I put a headlamp on and I have a flashlight too. Um, a reflective safety vest. So really important to be seen on the roads, especially in the conditions we're asking you to go out in. Uh, crossing signs. So we have some crossing signs for folks. If um, the crossing sign, someone was asking me at our last training, you know, why don't we just put a bunch of crossing signs out? 
and, uh, and then people will drive slow and the amphibians will get across the road. And the problem is they're really hard to see and uh, it doesn't really make that much of a difference whether you're driving 50 or 15. Uh, they're not going to be get, able to get out of your way. So um, really the crossing signs are more to let people know that you are out there um, doing a survey and to slow down. Uh, raincoat is really nice. Rain pants, it's going to be wet. Uh, rain boots are really important. Uh, a camera is nice, uh, especially, you know, it's nice to document what you find. We have a project using iNatural where if you send us photos from your road crossing site, we can upload it um, to this program called iNaturalist, um, or you can do that as well. Um, smartphone, extra batteries. Unfortunately, you are going to see some, some bad things in the road. Um, and in order to make sure you're not counting it the same dead salamander every time you walk back and forth, uh, a spatula is really handy, you know, kind of slide underneath and scoop them off the side of the room. A clean bucket, I actually use um, a cooler that has a lid on a hinge, that way I can put the lid back down, otherwise the spring peepers tend to just jump right out. At some crossing sites that are really busy, um, it's sort of impractical to move each individual across the road because you just keep moving back and forth across the road, so I carry a bucket. Get a, a cooler with a lid, and I put you know a bunch in the bucket. When I get my bucket pretty much full, I walk to the right, you know, the side of the road with the water, and I kind of you know, dump them out and start the process over again. You put anything in your bucket? Uh, just a little bit of. I mean, it's raining, so there's water in the bucket. But yeah, anytime you're touching these uh, amphibians, you need to be uh, have moist hands. So it's going to be raining. Your hands are probably going to be moist. Um, a point I will make, um, I have pretty dry hands, so I'm always putting lotion and things off on them. Before you go out to do this, wash your hands, make sure they're really clean, I'll, uh, light soap, and then rinse them really well. Uh, that way we're not um, uh, sharing our chemicals with these salamanders. Make sure you've got your data sheet and a clipboard uh, and a pen, uh, and then we are ready. What are we ready for, Zach? We're, we're ready, ready. We're ready for the Amphibian Road Crossing Fashion Show 2019. <laughs> so would you all help me welcome Sierra to the stage. Some of your clothes. 
windows, or um, do what you need to do to have reflective clothing, or lots of flashlights, which is why Lucy's also wearing a red reflector, uh, which, which motorists are alerted to me that there's a biker, there's somebody up on the road. Um, so lots of lights, lots of reflection. Um, orange hat, because why not? That's a little bit more visible too. So as, mu as much visibility as you can. Also sporting rain boots, also sporting rain pants. Um, sporting a, a bright strobe flashlight as well. Not sporting any insects, uh, any uh, bug spray or sunscreen or lotion on your hands, are you? I didn't think so. Of course not. Uh, but you are sporting one of our waterproof uh, data sheets with a clipboard, um, so you can keep track of your data out in the field. And that data sheet is two-sided. <laughs> it's fair. So uh, we mentioned that uh, when you do this protocol, you're going to start on one side of your site, and you're going to walk down the other side of your site. And every pass you take is one transect, is one survey. So we printed these out, these sheets out double-sided to get you back to your car on a second survey, right? So <laughs> the way out and the way back are two three surveys. Uh, what else we got? I think that's it. Great braids. Yeah. yeah. All right. Cool. A passionate spirit. Passionate yeah. spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for entry being across the season. Thank you. <laughs> and and so the last the last point I want to hit on is just to share with you. Um, we had our kind of first season of this uh, new relaunch project last year. Uh, how we did. So last year we surveyed 35 different sites in 19 towns, representing four counties, um, mostly in central Vermont. This year we're expanding a little bit beyond central Vermont. Uh, we had 46 volunteers last year that put in 179 hours surveying amphibians. Uh, some people put in more than 10 hours just on their own, which is pretty incredible. Uh, we helped 3,330 amphibians get across the road, which is really amazing. Uh, in Waterbury, we had uh, three generations of citizen scientists working together. Uh, grandmother, daughter, granddaughter team uh, working together uh, on a really important site in Waterbury. Still Land Trust, you know, uh, their team helped 171 amphibians get across in less than an hour and a half, which is pretty amazing. And then uh, in Cabot, one of our volunteers found a site where some fencing put up um, by road crews was actually causing frogs to get stuck and have to turn around and cross back across the road. There was a lot of mortality, and we were able to, to quickly get that problem remedied um, you know, by, through our survey efforts. So what you're doing is, is really important and, and can make some pretty quick change uh, for these amazing creatures. And now what? Now, now that you all know, now that you are really excited about amphibians, we've achieved our first goal. Our second goal is to get you out there um, and uh, adopt the site. So uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to stay up front and kind of answer general amphibian questions. And Sean is going to be in the back, and he's going to be signing people up if uh, you want to look at the map and see if there's a crossing site near you, uh, or if you want to sign up for the program in general. You can do that. Uh, this spring, we're going to have some pop-up nights where we have a site down the road here from the Nature Center. Um, if you're not feeling like you want to adopt a site for the season, but you still want to come out on a night and see what it's like at a, on a big night at a crossing site, uh, you can come out with us and kind of kind of see what it's like. Um, on our website, we have a whole page under Citizen Science uh, dedicated to our amphibian work. So under Citizen Science, you click on Amphibian Conservation. You scroll down, and on the right, you can sign up. This is the link to actually a volunteer. Um, if you find a road crossing that we don't know about yet, it's not a map, you can report it here. Um, we'd love to know. The volunteer manual that's in the back is actually right online. So if you're you know, an internet-connected person, you can um, read it online rather than taking a paper copy. And I would also add that, you know, so we, we kind of went over the protocol pretty quickly, and, and really it, it's, it's quite easy. I mean, the nuts and bolts are that you walk the transect, you take amphibians off the road, you record what you found, and a couple other pieces about, like, you know, how well, how much it's raining, cars that are passing, that sort of thing. There is, um, but each, but this protocol manual goes through each one of the things that we ask you in terms of data and, um, and gives a little bit more of a description of that. So we ask that everybody that wants to do this project either pick up a hard copy of this manual or uh, <coughs> download it online right there. Question? Um, on your website, do you have uh, like 
tonight's the night, tonight's a great night, or tonight's only 50% good or something? Ah, uh, yeah, so, um, so for those that came in a few minutes late, we're passing this clipboard around, um, which is the list that you want to get onto. Um, this is who we'll send the list out to, that, or who we'll send out these, these alerts to, saying, hey, tonight's the night, or tomorrow's the night, or something like that. It's also good to pay attention to the weather yourself, um, because, you know, as you know, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, rainy, dark, April, early May, that's, you know, if all those things come together, that's when things are going to be moving. Um, and so we'll send out alerts, but if you see that forecast, then you know that, and also, you know, if you live in Cabot, that's going to be very different than if you live in Richmond or, you know, out, out in the Champlain Valley or something. So we'll send out alerts, but just, you know, tailor those alerts to your own situation. And so keep, the, keep track of the weather forecast yourself. But I'll, um, I'm going to put this, uh, this clipboard um, in the back now so that if anybody wants to get onto that list that isn't on, that didn't get their name on, you can do that. In the manual, I didn't talk about this, um, but in the manual, we recommend that people go out at least once during the day to a site that they've adopted. That way they can kind of find where the site begins and ends. Um, see maybe where they're going to park their car, you know, when they're going to do the survey. And then also to see what the snow cover looks like because while well, we put out these very general alerts, um, you might have a site where, you know, it's a south facing slope and the snow's already melted and, you know, things are ready to go versus a site that's further north that has lots of shade and it's going to be three or four more weeks before things start to move. Um, right, and then, you know, pretty much everything you need is right here, including the crossing map. Um, so you can actually, it's an interactive map, you can click on things, you can scroll around, find the crossing sites in your view. Um, and what Sean is going to be doing is allowing you to go on and actually see if there's a site up for adoption um, and, uh, and get you signed up. So I want to talk about that just for a second. So if, if I back out here, you'll see that there's a lot of crossings in Central Vermont. There's not a lot of crossings outside of Central Vermont. There are crossings all over the state, as Zach has explained. Um, but there's only so many that we know about because we've only, you know, we only have so much time to go and try to um, use remote sensing and aerial imagery to try to identify these places. So. Um, if you live outside of this area and there's a crossing site that you know of that you'd like to monitor that's in your backyard that's you know, a little bit farther away than just kind of the Montpelier, Barrie, Cabot, Mound River area, um, then by all means, tell us where that crossing is. We'll make you a crossing site and you can monitor that site using these protocols and we'll just roll you right into the program. Our goal is to expand this so that we can cover the state over the next few years. Um, so there's a lot more crossings out there than what we've represented here. Um, so, uh, so in, in person tonight, if you'd like, um, you can talk to me and we can try to get you set up with, with the sites that you leave tonight with a site. The other thing that you can do is on your own, you can go to our website, you can click on, on, um, on the, the crossing map and go through this yourself and find, um, you know, find where you live and see where the closest site is and click that and you'll say, okay, this is ARC 059. <laughs> and, uh, and that's kind of the one that I think I want. And that's where I live near. Well, I can go and volunteer to adopt a road cross and they just put in ARC 059 and that'll send an email right to Zach and I saying this is your preference, this is the site you'd like to adopt. So you can do this all from the comfort of your own recliner at home if you'd like to, you know, take this information home and get back to us at the site that you'd like. We're going to do it right now tonight if you want. Um, so do check out the map. Um, and um, and then yeah, so this the and then the, the data form is um, is available. You can actually open it up as you can, you can open up the PDF and actually print it out yourself um, if you uh, if you run out. Or and um, once you have come back in and taken your raincoat off and dried off a bit and you're ready to enter the data, you just go to this online data entry portal and it'll just open up this form right here. And you'll put in all the exact same information on the sheet in the same order that this sheet is presented. So you just go through and just transcribe your information right under this and hit submit. And you can, you know, I have this, uh, this URL saved as a shortcut right in my home screen. So I can, on my, on my cell phone, I can just pop that open as an icon and I can go right to the, the data entry sheet. So I can skip the data form altogether and walk down the road 
um, at my site and just put in the data on my phone as I go. So there's low tech options, high tech options, um, but at the end of the day, um, all the data has to get into the online system to be submitted. All right. Well, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, and like I said, if uh, folks want to sign up tonight, they can head to the back of the room uh, with Sean. And if folks have general or more general questions, I'll be up here to answer those. Thank you all.